Welcome to the launch of the 2024 World Economic Situation Prospe Prospects Report, which is co-hosted by UN UIDA and UN DESA. The theme of the launch is on achieving SDGs despite slow growth. I'm Kunal Sen, the director of UN UIDA, which is a think tank in development economics and a an UN agency based in Helsinki, Finland. We are pleased to partner with UN DESA for the launch of the report. The 2024 World Economic Situation and Process Report is one of the UN's flagship reports in economics. The publication of the report is timely because we have significant concern that the world economy may be entering a period of slow growth with high interest rates and quite a bit of policy uncertainty at the moment. The conflicts in the Middle East and in Ukraine adds to this uncertainty. And after a period of pretty very slow economic growth and at times negative growth during the pandemic, uh, many developing countries can ill afford to see another period of slow growth, uh, which will obviously have an impact on the poorest of their citizens. It will certainly make many of the SDGs difficult to achieve. In this event, we will hear from our colleagues in UN DESA on the main findings of the report. Following this, we will debate the pathways and policies available to stimulate economic growth and accelerate progress towards the SDGs with an esteemed panel of researchers and practitioners. We'll also have around 20 minutes for question and answers at the end, and we look forward to receiving questions from the audience uh, online. Please put your questions on the chat function of the webinar, and I should also mention that we are recording the webinar for future purpose. I will now request Shantanu Mukherjee Director of Economic Analysis and Policy Division, UN DESA, to introduce the report, followed by a presentation for the, of the main findings of the report by Hamid Rashid, Rashid, Chief of the Global Economic Monitoring Branch of UN DESA. So, Shantanu, over to you. Thank you, Kunal, and uh, my warmest greetings to everybody gathered here, whether in New York City, Helsinki, or another maybe warmer part of the world. It's a great pleasure for us at UNDESA to be partnering with UNU Wider on this occasion. And I'd like to thank also all the colleagues who are making it happen. The SDG summit here at the General Assembly last September underscored the urgency of achieving the SDGs. Of course, that would be keeping a commitment the world made back in 2015. But more crucially, any progress towards that would expand the capacities of people, societies and economies to cope with periods of uncertainty, shocks and rapid change. What happens though, when the rubber hits the road? That's when you know resolutions meet implementation. Our report, The World Economic Situation and Prospects, launched in New York just about a month ago, presents a realistic assessment of what lies ahead in the short to medium term. Perhaps not everybody is familiar with this flagship report. It dates back to a UN General Assembly resolution of 31st October, 1947. That's 76 years back and counting. The resolution asked for a survey of current world economic conditions and trends annually, and also at such other intervals as necessary. Accordingly, we publish this report in January every year with a mid-year update around May and monthly updates as well. We believe that this makes the report the longest running continuously published report of this type, witness to the economic forces that have shaped much of our current circumstances. I hope that such perspectives and experiences will guide our discussions today, and we will arrive at a shared understanding of what needs to happen to accelerate progress towards the SDGs. Without further ado then, let me hand over to my colleague Hamid, who will be presenting the report. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shantanu. Thank you, Kunal. And good morning, uh, good afternoon, colleagues uh, from New York. Uh, now I'll share my screen. I hope that works well. Okay, and I need to go to the full from the beginning. So can you see my uh, screen well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so. Our report this year we launched on January 4th, which will uh, before uh, the other two reports that came out of the IFIs, um, namely the World Bank uh, Global Economic Prospects and the 
World Economic Outlook update that came later about 10 days ago. So our numbers are, uh, the forecast numbers that we present in the report are, uh, have a cutoff date of 1st of December, uh, 2023. So uh, since then also we saw quite a bit of changes in the global economic outlook, but overall our forecast numbers are broadly aligned or the other numbers that came out later are broadly aligned with our numbers. So there's no surprise. I think there's a broad consensus that 2023 was relatively unexpectedly a good year, but we see a downward trend in 2024. So uh, having said that, uh, I my presentation will be loosely based on uh, these PowerPoints. I'll not strictly follow slide by slide, but I'll put my comments into three broad buckets, uh, namely the good news and not so good news and the bad news. I think uh, most of the time it is spent on the bad news part and what we can do about it, right? How do we overcome this bad news uh, part of the story? So good news, uh, as I just uh, mentioned in 2023, surprised economic analysts uh, around the world. Uh, we expected a, a pretty tough year as the US Federal Reserve started um, raising interest rates mid 2022. Uh, there was a doom and gloom scenario um, towards the end of 2022. But that was not uh, realized. Uh, surprisingly, US economy proved to be very resilient in 2023, uh, followed by also China, uh, beat some expectation, and uh, some other major economies also did very well. And if, we, if you look at the top five or six largest economies, only country that uh, among those six uh, was that had a, a lower than expected growth rate was Germany. And other than that, and if you look at India, India also uh, performed very well. Um, other economies, Japan also uh, beat expectation in 2023. So overall, 2023 uh, uh, was better than expected. And for the US economy, the story goes that labor market was, uh, performance was quite robust. But we add an additional wrinkle or, uh, or argument in our report why that happened. Because in addition to the labor market outcomes, uh, net worth of U.S. households actually had a positive uh, gain, not just in 2023, but since the pandemic. Uh, U.S. net uh, uh, household net worth uh, increased sharply over the last three-year period. And that may sound counterintuitive. The reason it happened, because U.S. housing prices remained very robust in a very tight uh, housing market where supply was very tight and demand was quite strong and the prices uh, stood up. So house price, housing prices remained very resilient. And that really helped the US households to sustain their level of consumption. So we saw massive consumption actually uh, uh, binge in the US economy throughout 2023. And that uh, explained the uh, you know, very robust growth rate uh, that year. Uh, on the on riding on this housing prices, also uh, the financial assets also um, performed very well in the U.S. You, you, you'd be, uh, there's no surprise there. S&P 500 and all the other indices did very well. So overall, the balance sheet of the U.S. households remained very positive that supported consumption growth. China's story is slightly different where you see some uh, policy support, which really helped, especially third and fourth quarter, uh, um, um, lower interest rates at, at two interest rate cuts and a stimulus that was um, not exactly called a stimulus, but some bond issuances by the by the central government that helped uh, support investments and some consumption growth. So overall, uh, the Chinese economy also did very well. Another good news we saw in 2023, the, the countries that we as the UN uh, pay special attention to, the vulnerable group of countries, the LDCs namely did well. Uh, compared to 2022, so uh, did the landlocked uh, uh, developing countries. The seeds, the small island developing states didn't do as well, uh, but we see some uh, some improvements going forward. So that ends my uh, good uh, part of the story, uh, 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 the good news part. So not so good news part is that uh, we see uh, a weakening of global growth in 2024. Uh, across regions, if you look at all the countries, um, except for Africa, would see some uptick uh, in 2024, some improvement. West Asia, again, uh, our cutoff date was December 1st, but uh, we see 
uh, persistent uh, the geopolitical conflict in the region. So, but we were when we were writing, we were expecting West Asia would have some improvements on the back of slightly uh, higher oil prices for the region. But that may be revised downward going forward. But other than these two regions, we see uh, significant uh, 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 slowdown, especially the US economy, we expect the slowdown uh, to be quite pronounced uh, compared to 2023. And Europe would also face significant challenges uh, 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 in terms of the war in Ukraine and other challenges. Uh, so we don't expect uh, 2024 to be a great year for the European economy, uh, uh, European economies in general. And then if we look at uh, Latin America also sees quite a bit of headwinds and then commodity prices are not very, uh, doesn't look very uh, promising at this stage. So we have uh, challenges there for many countries in Africa. But again, looking at our vulnerable group of countries, we see some, uh, some positive uh, uh, outlook, especially for the seeds. We see improvement because tourism has uh, has come back significantly for many seeds, which is the main source of revenue for many of them. So, uh, one reason that that we see that improvement is because uh, globally inflation has has basically eased significantly since uh, 2023, uh, beginning of 2023, and that's a tighter monetary policy stance in the U.S. Uh, help bring down inflation, um, uh, and ECB also act, um, in, intervening very uh, um, effectively uh, brought down inflation significantly over over the, over the period over the uh, over twenty twenty three, and that has will probably open up some space uh, or policy space for some countries to to ease uh, monetary tightening or reverse it to some extent. Uh, also, the good news part uh, was labor market. Uh, especially in the advanced countries, labor market recovery was very strong um, um, since the pandemic. In the developing countries, of course, uh, the labor market is still quite weak uh, uh, and relative pre-pandemic level, still we see some challenges. And there's still also quite a bit of gender gap in the, in the labor market outcomes. So I have already um, argued that if you look at the region by region, this is where only improvement you'd see is uh, is um, Africa, some, some uh, the green, uh, bar is uh, the growth outlook for 2024 and you see uh, landlocked countries and ldcs and and seeds all three as a group would see some improvement in 2024 on the other hand uh, the other developing regions would see uh, deterioration in growth outlook so now let's get to the uh, bad news part what is driving this global trend so we see a secular trend of slowing growth uh, before the pandemic, the growth rate um, uh, averaged about 3% in the global economy. And we know that for the, uh, according to the SDG commitment, in fact, commitments uh, dating back to uh, the beginning of, uh, of the development decades, uh, that the least developed countries need to grow by 7% a year. That's the target, but we are nowhere close to the 7% growth rate for the least developed countries. And we see the significant challenges, headwinds for the global economy as a whole going forward. And how do we explain this uh, trending, uh, growth trending downward over the over the years? And so we, of course, there are short-term uh, shifts in the global economy, but also there are structural challenges that we have to pay attention to. The, of course, the biggest shock to the global economy was the monetary tightening that began in mid-2022. And after a long period of easy monetary policy, uh, near zero interest rates, we're seeing it, we saw a massive increase in interest rates over a very short period of time. That monetary tightening, of course, would have a real effect uh, uh, in terms of uh, investments and future growth prospects. And what uh, we can reasonably expect, and our report makes that uh, argument that uh, the central banks around the world, especially the, the systemically important central banks, the ECB and the Federal Reserve, they have indicated uh, higher for longer kind of in, uh, uh, stance where we'd expect interest rates to remain uh, relatively high relative to pre-pandemic levels. So we'll not go back to near zero interest rates uh, uh, um, under unless there's a major economic shock requiring settlement to uh, move very quickly. But this higher interest rate environment, uh, there will be a lot of adjustments needed in the real economy in terms of the most of the market participants were very used to having this ultra low interest rates for a long period of time. But, 
Another structural challenge that is uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, we have to keep in mind right, is that the, what we're seeing on the trade side, trade is to be the engine of global growth for a long period of time, especially for the developing countries. That was the main driver of economic growth and poverty reduction. If we look at China's uh, economic trajectory over a 40 year period, trade drove China's economic growth and brought down poverty rates from about 80% to uh, less than uh, you know 10% over a, a four decade period. That engine of growth is actually disappearing for many developing countries. We saw a remarkable uh, decline in global trade flows in 2023, which is almost unprecedented in, in a year that was not a recession year. So if you look at any year since the 2000 or even going back, of course, it, when there's a global recession, trade uh, takes a hit. But this was not a recession year, and we saw a significant decline in global trade. So part of it is geopolitical uh, uh, factors driving global uh, uh, trade uh, sort of diversion or trade uh, flow going in the opposite direction. Uh, we see the decoupling of the two largest economies. That is a major challenge. Developing countries uh, also uh, partly because of the, uh, the effect on tra investments, trade exports are taking a hit in many countries. So we see overall uh, trade uh, trending downward. And if you look at net export as a contributor to GDP growth, uh, for many of the countries, developing countries, the net export would become even bigger negative. That means it would have a more negative effect on global growth, uh, on growth of the developing countries going forward. So that's structurally, that's the biggest challenge for many of the countries, uh, I would say. And the third issue, although we don't go into a, a, a strong uh, sort of in great length discussing it, but we are probably not fully capturing the, the effect of technological change that is unfolding uh, globally right now, and namely the un unfolding of AI uh, and the, the pace of change. So in the past, we had significant uh, technological uh, shocks, but it was usually a, a, there was a long adjustment period. But this time, probably it is going to be very fast, and that would have a huge impact uh, in the labor market, both in developed countries, also in developing uh, countries. We have a box on, on the topic, but uh, I think this is where, again, the SDG implementation would, 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 would face some challenges. So, uh, and I, I already mentioned global trade. So the main challenge for the developing countries as we see it, and as we underscore in our report, is that very limited fiscal space. And on the monetary policy side, they can do even, even less because uh, most of the developing countries are the receiving end in terms of the policy uh, 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 rates set by the major central banks, namely the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank. So they can't independently uh, uh, have counter um, cyclical policies when uh, interest rates are rising in the, in the US or in Europe, they can't uh, cut interest rates. So there's a hurting behavior, there's a pressure for central banks to follow the lead of the major central banks. So on the monetary side, we don't expect a lot of uh, sort of uh, support coming uh, in developing countries to, to support investments and support economic growth, which are critical for, which are necessary conditions for achieving the SDGs. Not the sufficient condition, of course. We need uh, more than economic growth to uh, to reduce poverty and uh, uh, to uh, reduce inequality and achieve all the other SDGs. But uh, on the fiscal side, we see significant challenges as well for the developing countries. Many of the developing countries are uh, they and even before the pandemic, they had high levels of debt. But pandemic pushed up their debt levels significantly, especially external debt, uh, because. Unlike in developed economies where domestic uh, capital market was big enough, governments could borrow uh, to finance their pandemic response. In case of developing countries, they had to borrow from external sources, and that really increased their debt servicing uh, burden uh, for many de developing countries. As you can see, now almost 50 countries have debt service uh, uh, payment, which is 10% uh, of their government revenue or higher. So uh, median is about 9, 9, 9%. So this is a significant strain and that would affect spending on SDGs because uh, on one side, many of the countries are facing debt distress and debt overhang. That means they don't have enough uh, uh, free cash flow to invest in uh, new projects, new infrastructure projects and other projects. 
but on the other side also the overall government revenue take a squeeze because debt always uh, takes priority over other spending commitments so sdg spending uh, would hit a setback and we also this would affect uh, climate action spending on uh, uh, climate adaptation and mitigation efforts so overall this limited fiscal space poses a significant challenge for many, many developing countries uh, across the board, across a broad spectrum of developing countries, whether it's Latin America or Africa or, or South Asia. So we, this is where we believe that managing the debt level and uh, reducing, restructuring the debt burden would be very important going forward if we are, if they have to have a fair chance in achieving the SDGs. So in the final uh, slide, let me uh, just, uh, I already talked about monetary and fiscal policy. In the report, we make a strong case for industrial policy interventions. This is again uh, a, a topic that was not very popular up until recently. Uh, uh, now the industrial policy is uh, back in fashion. Many developed countries have actually actively uh, uh, sort of designed industrial policies uh, uh, to to basically to address climate change um, issues, but also uh, to uh, reshore their supply chains and and uh, and build resilient supply chains. So industrial policy has become a major tool, and this is where the developing countries will have to catch up with industrial policies. Uh, the idea of industrial policies is more targeted intervention where you get more bang for the buck. Uh, we have limited resources available in uh, because, of the, on the, because of the fiscal constraints that I just mentioned. So every dollar that has to be spent should have very high multiplier. And this is where uh, innovation policies are very important, improvising the technology and, and making sure that uh, we have the de developed countries are able to uh, selectively spend on R&D so that they have uh, better productivity outcome and they can have uh, a more growth, they can squeeze out more growth. And uh, we believe this is where uh, the efforts, more efforts need to be there uh, because without industrial policy, a, a traditional fiscal policy intervention, uh, large scale stimulus would not be feasible for many countries. So they have to be more targeted, more efficient fiscal spending. And we talk about fiscal efficiency as well in the report in terms of uh, reducing tax loopholes and, and other kind of fiscal leakages. But at the, on the, uh, the bottom line is that uh, there will be a, a clear need for more targeted industrial policy interventions if we have to re-stimulate uh, uh, growth in the developing countries. Final point that I would say is that given that there's very limited uh, uh, room to maneuver uh, uh, within the countries, uh, international cooperation will become increasingly important for uh, uh, for the many developing countries, including the LDCs and the SEEDs. And there, uh, one point we highlight very strongly is the need for timely debt restructuring and debt relief. And we have been talking about it uh, under G20 and other uh, initiatives. But we haven't seen enough uh, sort of breakthrough in terms of a, a meaningful debt relief for the large number of developing countries who are uh, either on the verge of debt distress or in debt distress right now. And it, you see few countries uh, in 2023 defaulted, even the, uh, some uh, star performing economies like Ghana uh, in, in Africa uh, defaulted, Ethiopia defaulted recently. So we have to stem that uh, that tide in terms of uh, if there's a cascading effect of more defaults, that would uh, really uh, further derail our efforts to achieve the SDGs. So I think uh, this is where the international community needs to come together and and provide more uh, direct and more uh, concerted make more concerted efforts to to provide uh, the needed uh, debt restructuring at, at this stage before it's too late. So this is where uh, international cooperation uh, is critical. So, and of course, I know we need to have more climate finance. Uh, obviously, many of the countries, when they are, uh, have to make difficult choices, often climate action uh, takes a back seat because they have to meet their uh, food security needs, other uh, needs before they can think about climate action. But this is where also international cooperation will be very important uh, going forward. So with that, I'll, I'll stop here and um, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. It's very clear and succinct presentation. Your presentation already raised several questions, actually, um, which we can see. We'll come back to those questions uh, from the online audience uh, a bit later, because now I wanted to introduce the panel. 
And Hamid, you will stay on for the panel too. So look forward to, of course, your, your insights in the panel discussion. So let's now introduce the panel that we have, a very esteemed set of uh, panelists here. And Hamid, do you want to just uh, stop sharing the screen? So we yeah, can I think I, oh, um, let me stop share. Okay, all yeah. right. Right, great. So now we can see all, see each other. So I'm going to introduce the members of the panel. And I will, so first starting with Yusi Oda Awala. Yusi is the executive representative of the private sector development at Finn Church Aid, which is a very large and a very respectable social organization working extensively in Sub-Saharan Africa and also other low-income countries. Um, so Yusi is going to bring us a practitioner perspective in the panel to so get a sense of how we can see from a practitioner point of view. So Yusi, look forward to your thoughts on that. Then moving on to Richard Kima, who's actually a colleague of ours in UNU Wider, a research fellow in UNU Wider, currently working on Southern Africa towards inclusive economic development program, SA Tide, in short, a very um, uh, program we have in South Africa. Uh, he says based in Pretoria. And Richard is a specialist in global macroeconomics. Richard will bring us more of the macroeconomics insights in the, in the discussion. And then last but not least, we also have Sana Kurunin. Sana is a senior economist at the Bank of Finland Institute for Emerging Economies, BOFIT, in short, based also in Helsinki, like UNI Wider. Sana is an expert has expertise in resource-rich economies, as well as in emerging economies such as Russia. So we're going to try and get some sense of what this might mean for resource-rich economies, also economies that depend on resources, so who import resources, so both direct, both sides of the story. So I'm going to now start, I'm really just going to start with uh, uh, with the macroeconomics perspective. So I'm going to start with Richard. Um, and Richard, I mean, so we have heard about from Hamid and, and the report itself also talks about slow growth happening along with inflational, inflation challenges. Of course, inflation seems to be trending downwards, but still pretty high, both in developed countries and developing countries. So how can developing countries accelerate growth without increasing inflationary pressures or exacerbating, making the financial stability situation worse? So hopefully not having bank runs and other sorts of problems in the financial sector. So what do you think would be the way forward for developing countries in this very tr tricky situation where they want to get great economic growth, but also there is a concern about inflation and financial instability. Over to you. Can you so seven minutes if you at the most, if you if you don't mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kunal, and uh, thank you for having me here uh, uh, in the panel. So to answer this question, I would like to kind of like set up a, a context and a background. So, um, and this year, so we know that the central banks uh, in developing countries and around the world, they've been facing, you know, this delicate balance and trade-offs to either curb down inflation, revive growth, and indeed ensure financial stability. And those, uh, and there are policy uncertainties out there, namely, you know, those who are connect, which are connected with uh, uh, the direction of, of monetary uh, tightening and by uh, the Federal Reserve or the European Central Bank, among others. And those policy uncertainties are looming large uh, for, for the real economy and financial markets. So, but uh, the full impact of this uh, monetary tightening, including indeed the competitive tightening uh, ongoing now, so uh, still not materialized uh, because of large uh, lags uh, in, in monetary uh, transmissions. <clears throat> So on top of this, uh, central banks in, in, in developing economies, they will be facing actually additional challenges. So uh, among others, so, uh, those of like uh, shrinking policy space for uh, dis discretionary policy adjustments, tightening uh, global financial conditions, growing balance of payment concerns, but also sudden stops and, and, and debt sustainability uh, risks. And to address uh, these challenges, uh, those central banks uh, can use a broad range of, of tools, uh, including capital flow management, macroprudential policies, and exchange rate uh, management, and all this in a first instance to minimize the adverse spillover effects uh, of monetary tightening uh, by, by the uh, developing economies. Uh, <clears throat> Some countries already have uh, successfully used these tools, and for, in, for, for instance, uh, Brazil uh, has successfully reduced, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, they kind of like reduced tax on, 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 on fixed income investments to zero. So during the, the great financial crisis, and this has successfully slowed down, um, uh, you know, capital outflows uh, from the country. And another example is uh, China's central bank. So the People's Bank of China, 
which has utilized uh, a range of exchange rate management tools to ensure the stability of the remnant bid, uh, including direct interventions uh, in the spot of, uh, and forward markets. So, so uh, in addition, um, developing countries uh, will need to kind of like maintain a, a strong a strong economic fundamentals uh, in order to minimize their vulnerability to, to external shocks, but also strengthen their technical and, and institutional capacities. But uh, that would include like timely economic and financial data collections and uh, strengthening of the supervisory capabilities. And all this will prepare them uh, to properly implement policies. <clears throat> And a, a range of yearly warning indicators uh, and country risk models that can be then, you know, help uh, be used kind of like to help monetary authorities spot domestic and external risk and, and vulnerabilities. And these countries can also develop various crisis related uh, models. <clears throat> and uh, so, and use those, you know, models to kind of like help uh, spot vulnerabilities. And 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 yeah. So and quantify you know the overall uh, vulnerabilities to crisis like sudden stops, as I mentioned earlier. And they can also use those models to forecast the possible size of economic outcomes, such as GDP loss, and assess the duration and and the probability of exit from a crisis. So uh, furthermore, uh, the implementation of fiscal policies as you know, uh, the colleagues highlighted earlier, so could kind of like help uh, these developing countries as well. And those fiscal policies so include the adoption of uh, prudent fiscal measures uh, and uh, counter-cyclical fiscal uh, intervention, but also the establishment of sovereign st stabil stabilization funds. And all of this can act as a shield you know, against external economic shocks and help boost aggregate demand and also manage you know, capital flows and, and attract stable investments. In particular, uh, developing countries, uh, we need to kind of like, uh, you know, uh, bolster the, the, financial, uh, the fiscal revenues uh, uh, through like in the short term, increasing uh, the use of digital technologies that can help them reduce tax avoidance or evasion. And in the medium term, governments in those countries uh, uh, can, you know, expand revenue through uh, more kind of like uh, progressive income, wealth, and, and, and green taxations. <clears throat> so uh, many of these economies uh, will also need to kind of like improve the efficiency uh, of fiscal spending and the effectiveness of subsidies, subsidies and, and better target uh, social protection programs. And in addition to that, uh, you know, by, by curbing fiscal deficit and, and adopting prudent fiscal measures, so these countries can alleviate undue pressures on their currencies. And as we all know, you know, a stable currency will not only install confidence in foreign investors, but also serve as a, 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 as a bulwark against volatile capital flows that can indeed, uh, you know, be triggered by uh, monetary policy changes uh, in, in larger economies. Furthermore, so it remains critical for, for these developing economies uh, to kind of like implement well-targeted industrial innovation policies as uh, the colleague highlighted earlier as well. And strengthening innovation systems and uh, absorptive capacities will kind of like be crucial for generating new and sustainable sources of growth and employment, uh, diversifying export structures and accelerating uh, the energy transition. And to, to kind of like, uh, as a final point, so uh, those central banks can also, uh, like central banks in general, basically, will need to kind of like, uh, you know, strengthen international cooperation and as the colleague highlighted earlier as well. So mo mostly, uh, you know, uh, international monetary policy cooperation and, and coordination uh, through communication and interactions between, uh, you know, monetary policy authorities uh, worldwide. And this will help minimize the adverse spillover effects of the major developed country central bank's policies on developing uh, economies. And uh, central banks can also strengthen collaboration uh, in monitoring and, and, and maintaining fiscal uh, stability, including identifying and addressing financial risks stemming from uh, climate change. So I think I will stop here as, you know, as a kind of like a set of uh, tools, you know, those, uh, um, uh, developing economies uh, could use to kind of like accelerate growth.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Actually, there are quite a few questions you'll get to again later on, on inflation yeah. control and inflation targeting. Um, so it'd be good to discuss what is possible with inflation control and inflation targeting, which is a very now much a well uh, understood policy, at least in advanced economies, uh, in the in the less in the in the developing country space. Uh, so yeah. we'll get back to that later on. But thank you so much for your comments. I want to now move on to Sana. So Sana, um, again with your interest in resource-rich economies. So what do you think the implications of the current global economic conditions are for resource-rich economies? And a, kind of a follow-up question on the other side of the of the story. So how will the commodity price shocks, the volatility of commodity prices that we've seen in the pandemic and even now, what does it mean for countries that depend on resources? So both on both sides, what do you expect to see as we look at the this year? Yes, Thanks. thank you. Uh, big, a big question. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the resource-rich countries um, because they... Um, there's obviously, they are facing many dif difficulties that are... Uh, that we're trying to address in the uh, SDGs. So um, it's very common for uh, these resource-rich countries to be uh, kind of in kind of a de development trap, uh, sometimes described as a, as a resource curse. Uh, there's rent-taking behavior, which leads to inequality in these countries. Um, often they undereducate their people, so we need to address these issues. Um, of course, sustainable uh, industrial regulation, labor protection, uh, very, very important issues uh, addressed here. But because I'm a central banker, I, uh, I, uh, even though there's some overlap with Richard's uh, comments there, uh, I'd like to talk about the macroeconomic issues and financial sector issues uh, that could uh, help to uh, help these countries to develop uh, their economies. So um, enabling financial sector requires um, macro stability. And uh, that means, of course, uh, sustainable budgets, uh, debt levels, functioning central banks, and um, stronger financial regulations, uh, macroprudential policies uh, that already Richard mentioned there. Uh, and of course, uh, these macroeconomic buffers are uh, should be well achievable for, for many resource rich countries with the uh, events of commodity price booms. And we have seen a lot of volatility in commodity prices during the pandemic, during uh, uh, due to the uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine, going energy prices up, due to green transition with some lithium or some particular minerals. Um, and this volatility is, uh, is definitely an issue that, that should be addressed in more, uh, with, with bigger focus in, the, in these uh, economies. Uh, of course, uh, Central bank inflation targeting, very important. Uh, flexible exchange rate. These are these uh, classic issues that are that we always uh, like to see in in uh, all uh, all countries, not just uh, developing countries, not just resource rich countries, but all, all the countries. But then this addressing this volatility that's uh, particular for these uh, resource rich economies. Um, we do observe this kind of boom bust uh, events uh, according to the commodity prices. Uh, and the problem is that these uh, booms and busts are often amplified by the financial sector. So during the boom, financial sector is uh, giving loans to not only to the commodity firms, but also to the other firms in the uh, in the economy. But then we, when we get the commodity price bust, then uh, also uh, banks face some kind of liquidity squeeze and are unable to provide financial services to other sectors of the economy, even though they might have still growth opportunities. So we need to try to strengthen the financial sectors in the way that um, they could avoid this kind of uh, boom, bust, and amplifying the booms and busts in the economy. Uh, 
because this also leads to uh, to the fact that uh, financial sector might be hampering the economic diversification, which also would help these economies to to mitigate the, the volatility of the economy. So, uh, if the financial sector is too much centered in in serving the commodity sector of the economy, then Possibly it's not serving very well uh, small and medium science uh, enterprises or households. And uh, of course, financial inclusion is something that, that definitely needs, uh, needs attention in, in many, uh, I'd say most developing countries, but also, uh, also some developed countries. So we still don't have uh, necessarily as... Uh, a strong financial inclusion globally that we we'd like in, in even in developed countries. Um, so this uh, for resource dependent countries, resource rich countries, this volatility is an issue. And I currently I'm afraid that we might still continue to see very strong uh, movements in in commodity prices and. Uh, these countries should be pre better prepared to face them with strong macroeconomic policies and also uh, by strengthening the financial sector. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. Actually, there's a question also in, in uh, from the audience, and I want to come back to that later because it's a really important question because we already had the Ukraine crisis, which led to increase in food prices and energy prices, some energy prices. But now we have an ongoing situation with the Suez Canal, which is going to lead to also increasing prices because lots of transportation is going to happen uh, where, uh, where, uh, where shipping will be have to go through entirely across the continent of Africa, which will increase uh, transportation times and, of course, increase prices. So there's a new situation happening right now, along with what else is happening in the Middle East. So I want to come back to that because that's a new development which we haven't really thought about uh, in, in the discussions that we have had uh, earlier. Uh, on the Ukraine crisis itself. So we'll come back to that, Sana, but thank you so much. I will now move on Thanks. to UC. And UC, so now let's bring in the development cooperation uh, uh,